video, we'll be going over IRS Form 13711, uh, Request for Appeal of Offer and Compromise. So you'll most likely receive a copy of this form uh, if you've submitted an offer and compromise on IRS Form 656-B and the IRS has re uh, sent you a rejection letter. So uh, you can request an appeal. Uh, we're going to walk through how you complete that appeal request in this video. We'll talk about some of the filing considerations and uh, kind of uh, go over some of the things that you may need to be aware of. Uh, so just keep in mind that we do go into a little bit more detail in our article. We'll put a link in the show notes. You can find that article on uh, teachmepersonalfinance.com, type in IRS form 13711 in the search bar, and you should see the article up here. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to go step by step through this article, or through this tax form, and then we'll talk about some filing considerations, uh, some things that you should probably include and account for when you're putting together your appeal request, and then some other alternatives that you may consider uh, instead of going toe to toe with the IRS on an offer and compromise. So let's start with the basics on this form. Uh, so uh, you should have received a, a rejection letter. This may accompany it. Uh, you probably also received what's called an income and expense table as well as an assets and equity table. Uh, so if not, uh, uh, there's an example of what those tables look like in the article. And so the IRS is basically making its decision on accepting or rejecting offers and compromise based on financial information that you put into that letter. So uh, in this request, we're going to, uh, before we submit this request, we're gonna need to take a look, a closer look at what we've already submitted and then just compare that to uh, what the IRS should be considering uh, based on your situation. So at the very top of the form, you'll see taxpayer information fields. So um, in this case, John Doe and Mary Doe, they're uh, individual taxpayers filing Form 1040. Uh, so we've populated this tax field with their information, John Doe, the taxpayer ID number, uh, could be a social security number, as it is in this case. Could be an individual taxpayer ID number. Uh, that's specifically for uh, individuals that aren't able to obtain a social security number. Uh, or for non-individuals, it could be an employer identification number or EIN. So that's a nine-digit number. You should know that it should be on either your tax return or the IRS letter that you received. So we'll put the, uh, their address here. Uh, just keep in mind, uh, this is not an official change of address form. So if your address is different from what your IRS record says it is, uh, the ways that you can update it are by filing a tax return. Uh, if you're out of season for filing tax returns, then you should consider filing either IRS Form 8822 or IRS Form 8822-B for business taxpayers. Those are the official uh, IRS change of address forms. You can also call the IRS, sit on hold for a while, uh, validate your information, and then change your address over the phone. So keep that in mind because uh, especially if you're in the IRS collections process, uh, you're going to be receiving uh, continued IRS correspondence and your action items, uh, basically uh, the timeline uh, starts with whatever the date is on your uh, correspondence. For example, if you received a rejection letter dated 30 June of 2024, uh, and you're about to put together this request for an appeal, you have 30 days. So that means uh, it doesn't matter if you received your uh, letter on the 5th of July or if you received it on the 15th, the IRS will 
uh, just assume that after 30 days you agree with everything and they're going to continue with the collections process. So keeping your address up to date in your tax record is one of the most important things that you can do to make sure that you keep receiving correspondence in a timely manner. Not just until you get through the current tax issue, but to make sure that t down the road tax issues don't pop up and catch you by surprise. So consider that. We'll put links in the show notes to those to resources we've created about those uh, those uh, change of address forms and how to fill them out. So in this middle section right here, uh, this is you don't have to uh, appoint an authorized representative. But uh, the IRS does have an, a power of attorney form, IRS form 2848. So in this case, the Doe's have uh, delegated authority to, uh, to James Smith, uh, their accountant, so that he can represent them in any ongoing discussions, correspondence with the IRS. So we've put James Smith's contact information here, his phone number, best time to call, so on and so forth. So the rest of the form basically uh, it contains room for one or more disagreed items uh, and then uh, a certification of both the taxpayer and the uh, representative. So uh, for each disagreed item, you would complete basically a section right here. So for example, let's imagine that we listed assets on our 401k plan and it says, for some reason, we got it back, and the rejection letter showed that our listed assets were incorrectly listed at $500,000, and they should be at $100,000. This may change whether or not they accept the offer and compromise, or it may not. Uh, so uh, you would put it, the, the disagreed item here, the reason why you disagree, and then you would attach supporting documentation. So in our article, we kind of break down uh, a little bit more in depth on the things that you should be looking at. Uh, for example, when it comes to income and expenses, uh, the IRS uses uh, something known as national uh, like collection standards. So these are national standards for how much things should cost. So whether it's food, clothing, and other items, out-of-pocket health care, housing and utilities, transportation, so on and so forth. So uh, one of the things that you could possibly uh, do to, you know, um, appeal this is kind of go through those. Uh, for example, if you listed your rent at $10,000 per month and the IRS comes back and says, well, according to these national standards where you are, you should be paying $1,500 a month. Well, that might be realistic. I mean, if you listed $10,000 for rent, the IRS will go back and review your listed expenses, uh, any supporting documentation, and then where there's not justification for the increased expense, uh, then the IRS will enter or change that item to reflect the national standards. So the first thing that I would suggest is probably taking a closer look at uh, the, the documents that you may need to uh, discuss either internally with your spouse or with an IRS appeals officer. So for example, uh, the asset and equity and the income and expense tables that accompanied your denial letter uh, should you should match that up with your collection information statement that you submitted when you submitted your so this is the document so what I would do is take a look at the information that's listed in that correspondence and then you know those tables and I would match those to make sure that all of this information uh, reflects what we reported so if it does reflect what we reported then I would go back and make sure that anything that was edited by the IRS is consistent with those collection financial standards. And if they made some sort of, you know, adjustment here, 
I would at least take a closer look to make sure that I understand what that adjustment is. And then from there, you can either disagree with supporting documentation. Uh, you can um, provide documentation that shows, hey, I'm in this lease. It's higher than what you've allowed. Here's the lease document that shows my financial obligation. My legal obligation is whatever the lease says. So you do have some recourse on how to navigate this, but it does also require you to do a little bit of legwork or at least uh, share some of your information with someone that can represent you in this regard. So your accountant, an enrolled agent, even a tax attorney, uh, a lot of tax professionals uh, may do this on a, routinely bas on a routine basis and they may be able to help you navigate this. Uh, so the, the final thing that I will say on this is that there are two major areas where uh, the IRS will consider an offering compromise, you know, uh, based on information they, that you give uh, as opposed to, um, you know, just following the book, right? So following the book would be following the national standards. The national standards say you're allowed X amount of money for clothing. You listed Y, we're going to take the difference and that's what you're entitled to. So all of those things combine into an IRS determination on whether or not to accept your offer and compromise or not. So there are two major terms that you should probably be aware of. One is economic hardship. That literally is defined as uh, the IRS placing a burden on you that leaves you unable to uh, fulfill uh, or support your basic needs. And then effective tax administration really goes along the lines of a public, they call it public policy, uh, which includes economic hardship, but it also does include certain situations where uh, for, you know, a greater good type purpose, really kind of a not tangible consideration. But if there is a determination that uh, under effective tax administration, uh, the IRS would be better off uh, kind of accepting your offer and compromise or at least negotiating a little further uh, to a, a more agreeable solution for both parties. Those are the two major areas that the IRS would really consider. I mean, if you just list, hey, this is too expensive or I can't afford to pay these taxes, the IRS really is going to ask you to put more effort and information into this. So the entire purpose of this form is to list things that you disagree with that are supported by documentation that you can provide. And if you can't really do that, then the IRS uh, Office of Appeals, which is a higher authority uh, than the revenue officer, really isn't going to take a look at, at your situation. So you need to give them something that has a basis, some sort of rationale based on, you know, an evaluation of what you submitted, you know, comparing its accuracy to what the IRS rejected, you know, so making sure that what the IRS rejected is what you reported, making sure that what you reported was actually correct and that you didn't make a mistake. Uh, and then also making sure that um, any adjustments that the IRS m made, that you understand them. And if you disagree with those adjustments, that you have a logical way to explain your side of the story. I mean, all of that will get to the appeals process, but you've got to put it out there in this form. Now, now, if you disagree with multiple items, which is very possible, then you can put as many items as you want on the back, and the IRS says you can just keep going. So what I would recommend is that for each item, you keep them separate so that it's, and uh, what I would pro also suggest is that you put them in order. Uh, so let me pull up, the uh, asset and equity tables, there's, there's a, there should be, 
um, in the article, I actually put a copy of the monthly income expense statement. And you can actually go line by line uh, in a very similar manner. So each of these tables has these items here, items 13, 14, business assets, things of that nature. And what I would do is I would list them in order. So item one is probably cash, I think, and then item you know two, so on and so forth. I would list them in order uh, so that you make it very easy for someone that is looking at your uh, request to kind of understand things from your perspective. They might not agree, uh, but the purpose of this form is to request an appeal so that you can discuss it. So finally, the, the last thing that we'll discuss in this video, um, other than what we do at the end, uh, is other alternatives uh, to an offer and compromise. So an offer and compromise is the IRS accepting less money than what they feel that they are entitled to uh, because to fully impose a collection would impose some sort of economic hardship or violate a public policy kind of decision. Uh, you can also request a mediation uh, at several levels. So if you've been in discussions with a revenue officer, the basic collections agent, uh, and they make a decision, you can request a mediation from that. If the Office of Appeals has made a decision, you can also request a mediation. And this would be for a situation where you feel like you're close enough to, you can avoid litigation, but you're not happy with the position that the IRS is trying to give to you. You feel like there's maybe a little bit of, of a better solution for all parties. And so you'd like to do that. You can also uh, request an installment plan. So instead of just writing a check for the full amount, even if it's less than what you owe, you can break it up into installments. Uh, and we'll put links in the show notes on how you can submit that. So w once you get all of your disagreed items here, you'll want to A, make sure that you have your supporting documentation. And the way I would look at this is disagreed item, 401k, listed assets, uh, which I confirmed with the rejection letter. For some reason, the rejection letter said $500,000. I went back to my uh, filed form 656, verified that it was $100,000. I attach a copy of my 401k statement showing that it's $100,000, you know, and then that's a very clear thing for me to be able to say, this is why I disagree. Now, whether you disagree with something, I mean, whether the IRS accepts that uh, and, and that impacts their decision, that's irrelevant here. At this point, you're, you're, trying to, you're trying to get an appeal, like an extra personal look at it. But while you're uh, offering compromises being considered during the appeals process, uh, the most important thing is that the collections process stops. So anytime that you request an appeal if you do it in a timely manner uh, while the IRS is processing your appeal and considering a decision uh, then that's giving you a little bit of breathing space so that you can you know kind of get some assets together some you know get a little bit more financial stability to start making your payments this isn't a you know this isn't meant to be free time to just blow things off you should be constructively putting together a plan uh, for you because, you know, at the end of the day, the IRS may accept less than what they're entitled to, but they're still going to make sure that they've left no stone unturned when it comes to looking at your assets, which means it's still going to hurt. Uh, even if, e even if you owed $10,000 and you're able to settle for $4,000, to get to that point, you're going to have to do a lot of heavy lifting on your own. So it might be worth it in your situation, but you need to be prepared to do some of the work. And while the IRS is considering your appeals, you can be talking to a tax professional. You can be asking additional questions about the process, what the next step looks like. Again, you're, you're trying to get yourself into a position where you can make a better offer, where you can, uh, 
start making payments on the regular. So at the bottom of the form, you're going to sign it. If both, if, if, if you're married filing a joint return, both spouses should sign it. And then below this, your authorized representative should sign and date. Uh, you would attach your form 2848, which is the power of attorney declaration form. And then your representative is going to check one of two boxes. The top box basically says that they've submitted this, all the accompanying documents, they've reviewed the documents, and to the best of their knowledge, they believe that the facts that are in all of this documentation are cr true, correct, and complete. The second box basically means I took this pile of paperwork from my client, but I don't personally know their financial situation well enough to be able to tell the IRS what's right and what's wrong. So the reason why you should be aware of this is because if your uh, accountant has all of your information and they check box one, you, they, they might just keep going. You might not hear a whole lot from the, them as they're going back and forth with the IRS. A good tax professional should always keep you in the loop, but there's a lot of back and forth going on that you may not need to know the details. Whereas in the second one, you can probably expect that your tax professional is going to be coming back to you for a lot of clarification on questions that the IRS has for you. So this is where you as a taxpayer should probably make a decision. You know, do I want to give more information to my tax professional so they can take care of everything? Or do I want to remain involved because I want to, there's certain information that I want to keep for myself. Just knowing that and discussing it with your tax professional would be beneficial so you kind of understand how involved you're going to be in this process. So then at the bottom of the form, they're going to sign it and date it. Again, if you have a representative, they'll probably actually submit the correspondence for you. But if not, if you're handling this on your own, there should be an IRS office uh, address located in your rejection letter. Uh, you should send this completed form uh, to the address that's listed in that. And there's not going to be, you know, a standard address for every single applicant. It's going to be based on your tax situation, what type of tax return you're filing, the IRS service center that's handling your offering uh, compromise submission. So uh, pay attention to the letter. It may or may not be the same as the original office that you submitted the offer and compromise to. Uh, so just, you know, pay attention to the letter, follow the instructions. Uh, they should be fairly clear. And, um, and, and again, you know, attach as much documentation as you think will support your arguments, but make them, you know, take a step back and kind of make your arguments a little bit more clear and objective so that if you were the person trying to understand your situation, you, you feel like you, you would have a good handle on it. Uh, so that's all we have uh, for this video. We'll put links in the show notes to uh, resources we've created uh, about some of the forms uh, mentioned in this video. So if you like our articles, please subscribe to our newsletter. If you like our YouTube videos, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you have any questions or comments, or if there's another topic that you'd like to see covered in an upcoming video, please hit me up in the comments section. Thank you very much and have a great day.